Hello, healers. Welcome back to our next webinar, uh, in our Finding Your Way Back series. And today we're going to be finding our way back to compassion. And today you are muted and your camera is off uh, for recording purposes. Uh, but we will be having a Q&A session uh, at the end of the webinar. So write any questions you have in the chat box and we'll get to them at the, at the end. We're going to go ahead and jump in. So who are we? We're Luke and Lauren Smallcomb. We are a married couple of this month, 16 years. Uh, we have the privilege of teaching and uh, walking with people who are recovering their physical and emotional health. We are the founders of Flourish Therapy, a global virtual practice where we do this work. Train, uh, trauma healing and brain new training is our um, area of specialty and we love what we do. So this is a webinar series on the pillars of healing that we believe and that we have seen be so powerful for people on their journey of, of recovery, of wholeness. And so compassion is um, the third and compassion is something that has taken Luke and I uh, um, a while to become more fluent in the language of compassion for ourselves. We've always been really compassionate for other people. And we've both been in the helping fields for a decade, decade and a half. And we've loved working with people, but bringing that level, that next level of inner compassion, self-compassion has taken a lot of work and a lot of rewiring away from um, condemnation, shame, uh, even disdain, things that we, uh, messages that we had assimilated about ourselves and our worth and even beliefs about self-compassion, which we'll get into more as we jump in further. So compassion has not been easy for us, self-compassion, and we're excited to kind of give this little uh, quick primer on what it is, what it looks like, how it helps us, how it heals us, what barriers are to it. And we just think it will be really helpful for you wherever you're at on your journey to take that next deeper plunge into really meaningful self-compassion. So as you're listening, who is this webinar specifically for? What is compassion good for? And it's good for all of us, but specifically, do you have these perfectionistic tendencies, uh, strong inner critic, prone to shame, stuck on the un, undesired cycles and you're driven to try harder, those might be symptoms that say compassion may be lacking and maybe you could benefit for some, from some compassion, self-compassion. So what is self-compassion? Uh, there's three, three um, examples here from a, a great article. Um, a lot of research went into this. Self-kindness versus self-judgment. So what self-compassion is, is self-kindness. It is being kind. It's in, it's in the name. Uh, it's gentle. It's gracious. It's understanding. Um, it's not judging. Uh, it's, it's not um, critical. It's not shameful. Uh, it's common humi humanity. It's just understanding that we are human. Everybody struggles. Everybody falters and, and self-compassion we struggle with it when we we struggle <laughs> we struggle giving self-compassion when we are having our times we're not feeling great um but we're human and we're going to have times where we're not going to feel that way um rather than so it's understanding that humanity that's what self-compassion is just understand that we're just human not feeling like we're we're the only ones that struggle this way that's not self-compassion um, we're, we're in, we have company in the midst of struggles, mindfulness, uh, mindfulness versus over-identification. Mindfulness is just being aware. I struggle. I have, uh, weaknesses. I have strengths. Um, and I have days where they're hard, but these, these struggles and these hard times, they don't identify me. They're not who I am. They're just 
part of my experience and maybe part uh, from parts of my story. And so we're just mindful of it. We're aware of how our story is affecting us, but we aren't identified by it. Um, Luke, if you could go back to that last slide, I want to jump in with a, something Luke and I say often, um, just an observation of ourselves and of others is the people that are most controlled um, by their emotions are the least aware of their emotions. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of this, um, would that be paradox or um, it's just kind of ironic that it's that inverse relationship the more you don't have that mindful awareness of your sensations, emotions, uh, what you're feeling, you, those are the people that tend to be the most driven by those feelings, in fact. And when we bring mindfulness into our experience and we can look and observe, um, curious observer is one of the terms for uh, adopting a mindfulness lifestyle. When we can have that um, mindfulness about what we do, what we feel without this um, critical self-judgment, like in point one, we can kind of unattach from the deep consuming identification we've had with that thing. And we can see it more accurately and not be driven so much by it. So. Yeah, I just think that's really powerful that mindfulness makes us less um, a victim or controlled by those emotions that are really strong. Yes. So what self-compassion is not, this is, gets tricky. because Some of these things we are taught, this is self-compassion. Um, but it's not permissive. So that's a lot of fears of people like, oh, if you have that empathy and that compassion for yourself, you're just going to not have accountability and you're just going to get away with everything. That's why we can't give our kids compassion because then they'll just think everything's okay. But it's not permissiveness, it's balanced. Um, so we're not saying you get to do whatever or you should let other people do whatever, but there, it's not permissiveness. Uh, it's, not, there is a, it's not having no accountability. Um, it's not being that prideful, denying flaws and weaknesses. Like I said, it's, it's having awareness, that mindfulness. Uh, it's not being a victim and just having self pity of poor me. I, I've had a hard life. I just can't, I just can't uh, overcome these hard things. I just, um, I was just dealt a, a hard hand and this is just who I am. It's not that. Um, so as you'll see, as hopefully you're seeing through the series, there is hope. As you'll continue seeing, there is redemption. We can heal. So it's not that self-pity. It's not living in, uh, not living in reality. So it's living in reality. It's um, acknowledging I do have struggles I need to work on. Uh, it's not, I love myself so much and I'm not going to listen to anything bad that people say about me or anything bad that uh, like any insight that people are saying that I need to work on. It's not that. It's living reality of, I, ha I have struggles. Um, my story is affecting me. My, my trauma is uh, impacting me in my relationships. It's not judging it, but it's then having that compassion and saying, okay, let's, let's work on this. Let's understand it. So it's, it's living reality. And it's not living in unreality, not reality. <laughs> Um, and so what are the barriers that keeps us from having self-compassion on ourselves? Compassion is the first, it's supposed to be cultivated as a child. So one of the barriers is not, it not being cultivated as a child. So not being shown it, not experiencing it. Um, it's that, and a lot of these things come from it not being cultivated. So having an inner critic, that's that. It's that that's that judgment, the um, uh, over-identification of it. Um, so that can be a, a, a barrier because it's always looking at the shame. It's always having that negative bias. It's always looking for what is needs to get better. Uh, 
So a lot of times in our stories, if it's not cultivated, our, a lot of our caregivers have told us like, well, there's things that we've done that have stopped us from having connection. So the inner critic comes in and says, this keeps us from, from connection, so we need to fix it. So that's not self-compassion. Survival, not self-compassion. Uh, if you're getting the messages that compassion is weak, um, that you have to try harder, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, um, those are barriers. Those messages are barriers. Being shamed by other people, but if we have been shamed by other people of being sensitive, of having emotions, of being, of being quote unquote needy, um, a lot of times we, if we've been shamed, we just pick up where, the, where our caregivers are left off or where other people have left off and we continue shaming ourselves. Losing our voice, not feeling like we are heard, um, nervous system dysregulation, emotional tenderness is weak. So a lot of, so some of these maybe are more prominent in men. Um, and that's a, maybe an overgeneralization or a stereotype, but like a lot of times men are given that message that, hey, emotions, tenderness, that's not okay. So we as men don't give ourselves that permission to have self-compassion. Um, messages that you don't matter. So why would I give compassion myself if I don't, if I don't have value? And we might, uh, you don't, you need to be strong you need to, so that can be also protection of self-compassion will take your guard down, will open you up for vulnerabilities. So you have to be strong. Uh, not experiencing it from others, not believing you're worthy of it, and just self-loathing or self-hatred. So these are barriers that are within ourselves, the messages that we've received that a lot of them are subcon subconscious but they're gonna be barriers and get in the way of us having that compassion and being open to, having, uh, to giving self-compassion. And like Luke mentioned, nervous system regulation. We wanna highlight that as we believe that it is a massive, um, the state that we're in is a massive determiner of whether we have access to self-compassion. So here's a quote from Anchored um, by Deb Dana. I was gonna show that last webinar. I'll show it now. So here's the book. Um, actually, I can't remember what webinar I was going to show that in. But anyways, this is, a, this is a really great book on regulation. So she says, self-compassion is the emergent property of the ventral vagal system, which is what we refer to as safe and social. Survival states automatically activate self-criticism. So when we move out of safety and connection into a state of protection, we actually lose the capacity for self-compassion. So the three states of the, the nervous system, safe and social, sympathetic, and shut down. And these two bottom states are when we are activated in, into a defensive state, that when there's threat perceived. And when we're in those states of fight or flight or shutdown, self-criticism is automatically activated that's a physiological shift of how we see ourselves. And so, as you can imagine, when you have self-criticism, it's very hard to foster self-compassion. And so it's another reason why nervous system regulation is central to everything we do at Flourish, because um, if you can help to shift your state and spend more time in that safe and social zone, you're gonna naturally have more access to self-compassion and it'll be much more easy to cultivate. It won't feel like you're like pulling teeth. It'll be a more natural byproduct. So how self-compassion changes us. We experience healing through self-compassion. It helps to rewire our brains. We release neurotransmitters through self-compassion. It helps to tone our vagus nerve we gain deeper access to compassion for others. It can shift our state, like we were just talking about, to return to safe and social. So it's one of those relationships that's both and. Self-compassion can help you shift to safe and social, which is the regulated state, or being in safe and social can help you cultivate self-compassion. 
It adds new experiences to wounds, which brings a new option to our survival brain. And I like how you just said, like, it's a both and. You have access to self-compassion, safe and social, and it brings you to safe and social. And I hope as you're listening, you start seeing there's a lot of interaction here. Like with the pillars, like with self-compassion, you have access to beauty, as we'll talk about later. And with, within beauty, you have access to self-compassion. With acceptance, you have access to beauty. And with acceptance, you have access to self-compassion. And so sometimes when we're feeling, we experience a lot of trauma, we feel stuck and like there's not a lot of option. But I hope that you're starting to learn and hear that we do have options. We're just not aware of them. There is ways out towards healing. We just don't have the language and the understanding. There's actually a lot of resources and access to safe and social and healing. It just takes work. And it's not easy, um, but it's also possible and there's options. Yes, so we're gonna help you walk through a little practice right now, just a few minutes long to help you have access like we was talking about. Um, okay, so where, however you're listening to this, you can, you can practice this. Uh, if, if you're listening to this in podcast form and you're driving, be careful, but wherever you are, um, you should be able to try out this practice. So if you could take your hands and put them over your chest, over your heart, and just kind of settle into your body a little bit. Take a few slower deep breaths. I really like to close my eyes when I do certain visualization practices or mindfulness practices. It helps me to kind of feel more embodied and feel like I'm here in, in my body. That might sound funny if that's not verbiage you're used to. That's okay. So imagine the feeling that you have had in your life of people showing you self-compassion. Just people showing you compassion. You not, not you showing self, I'm sorry. People showing you compassion, extending that to you. Just try to get a feel, try to tap into that feeling in your body when that has happened. Maybe it makes you feel love and lighter and seen. Maybe you feel warm and comforted. What does that feel like when people have extended compassion to you? So I want you to think about that feeling, try to access that feeling. And I'm just gonna walk you through um, um, a example of this happening. So say something really distressing has happened. You feel really upset and you call a really good friend who's really great at attuning to you and showing care. So your friend says, oh my goodness, come over. I, I wanna talk to you about this. I'm here for you, you can come over. And as you rush to their house, your heart is just racing. Your body feels like a buzzing, a, a tightly wound, uh, pressured anxiety and frustration and hurt. And you're just feeling so intensely feeling these emotions. And you, you step into your friend's house and you take a seat with them you're sitting on the couch and um, just instantly they welcome you with warm eyes and a soft, tender posture. And they're opened up to you. They're not hunched over and closed away. They're open, they're receptive. And as you sit on the couch with them and you share your heart, you pour out the, the hurt and the angst and the frustration and whatever this pain is, they're able to carry it. They're able to, to enter in and co-suffer with you. It's not too much. 
Your emotions aren't too big. They don't want you to tone it down. They're right there holding space. And as you start to cry, they grab you a tissue and hand it to you. And maybe it feels nice if they put their hand on your knee and just give you a gentle little squeeze that they're there and they get it. Maybe they haven't experienced this, but they know what it's like to suffer as a human. And they are so, so empathetic with you in this. And their compassion is just felt like an energy in the room, just a tender, loving compassion. I'm gonna get you a glass of water and talk with you. They don't try to fix it. They don't critique where maybe you didn't get everything right. They're not fixing your perceptions or telling you your emotions are too big. They just receive it all with love and kindness and support. And when you feel like you've talked enough, maybe they give a gentle but firm hug. Not afraid, they're not afraid of this. They can handle it, your relationship can handle it. And they take you into a room where you can just rest. Maybe you take a nap because you're just emotionally exhausted from that experience. And that friend was just there for you. They received you with all the love and care and support. They were there. They helped you navigate through those emotions. They co-regulated you. And they didn't judge you. They extended a real, real compassion that helped you have self-compassion. And that, that experience that they've given you felt so good in your body. It felt so good to have a safe place. So take a few deep breaths. Now that practice is how others can give compassion. And the best news ever is it's also how we can give compassion to ourselves. What that good friend did for us in that visualization is what we can do for ourselves when we're facing hard emotions, hard symptoms, hard sensations. When we're facing the, the angst of being human and the challenge of living in these dysregulated bodies in this broken world, we don't have to have that other person there all the time. That's a powerful way to have that attunement and co-regulation through someone extending compassion and we should pursue it, but we can also give it to ourselves daily, moment by moment. We can foster this new posture of compassion with ourselves, And that's something that no one can ever take away from us. Wherever we are in the world, whatever scenario we find ourselves in, we can tend kindly and tenderly to the raging emotions and experiences that we have as humans. And that is such a gift in our healing. A common but frequently unrecognized side effect of traumatic life experiences is an excessive harshness towards oneself, which often coexists with a healthy degree of care and concern for others. So maybe it was uh, hard for you to picture having that self-compassion for yourself, um, offering that to yourself, but you can do it to other people. You can be that friend that listens, that understands, that guides, that gets the water, that gets the tissue, that holds the hand, that gives rest. But sitting there thinking about it, for you, giving it to you, it's hard. Uh, that's just, that's normal. If, if you've experienced trauma, uh, big T trauma or little T trauma, that is just the effects of, of those experiences. Is we have a hard time offering that self-compassion, being that safe place but we can learn to be a safe place, 
just like we learned how to be a safe place for other people, we can be like, learn how to be a safe place for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're not broken and incapable. We're just wounded and haven't been taught. So if that, if that practice was hard, if this practice is hard for you, it's okay. You're just human. And you've just had some hard things happen. You've experienced trauma. And so we just invite you in that struggle just to have some compassion of and, and awareness that this was hard. And it's okay. Another way to um, connect with our own selves and stories is through other people's words and stories. Sometimes that's why we love um, emotional movies or books or poetry because it gives us words for our experience. And when we gain that, um, when we gain access to understanding our experience better, that's kind of paves the way for us to then offer compassion to it. So this poem we just thought uh, really paints such a beautiful picture of um, asking for compassion from others and also for uh, herself, realizing how, how tender we need, need to be. So it's called Tread Softly. Tread softly, she wants to give these words to everyone she meets. Tread softly past this heart of mine, this heart that's just unfurling now opening again, reaching out so bravely to the sunshine of life, instead of hiding safe inside this cage made out of bone. She wants to love and hope, believe and feel again, once more. But the pain of her past, her present, the fear, some days it seems so heavy and she hides her heart away. Yet, there are moments that she holds it up and open, breathes out the words and prays they will be heard and heeded. She pleads, tread softly past this heart of mine, this soul, this body, these hands that have been empty year by year. Tread softly while I learn to live. Such a beautiful, beautiful picture. Hmm of learning to see yourself in such a light of I've, I've made it through, I've survived whatever was here and I am learning to live again. And instead of seeing all the ways that you failed and the decisions that you made that didn't help things and those are the things that humans usually focus on, right? But that poem just invites us to a, such a tenderness of realizing we've hidden away inside this, this cage of bones in our bodies because outside has been too dangerous. There's been too much threat. We've experienced way too much hurt in relationship. But now as this person is unfurling into opening up into the world, she's realizing that she just needs tenderness and that she will find a way to live again if she can have that tenderness from others and self. I love the way it, it paints the picture of that struggle of being hurt and the, like drawing in, being brave and opening up and the begging of like, make it be okay with for me. Like I'm, I'm taking this brave step, please be safe. And how often do we do that for ourselves? Do we take that brave step? But really, we're just asking, like, be safe. Let me be. Let me make mistakes. Uh, let me learn. Let me be human. And and when we can do that for ourselves, it's just a it's a game changer. Mm -hmm. uh, why self compassion is essential for emotional health? You can't heal without it. I think that's kind of what that poem was just saying. Like we, we need that kind of self-compassion, that space to, to explore, to adventure, to try, to fail, and to try again. It brings safety to our nervous system. 
when we have experienced a lack of safe places, but we can have self-compassion for ourselves and be safe for ourselves, it brings regulation to our nervous system because our nervous system has a new experience of saying, oh, we can find safety here. Maybe we could, maybe other people couldn't give us safety, but we can give safety to ourselves. It softens us to beauty. Again, like I was saying before, it they interest all these pillars interact with each other and overlap. Uh, when we're in safe and social, we can have access to beauty. Beauty can bring us into safe and social. Self-compassion can bring us into safety, give us access to beauty. But when we're in that protection, without self-compassion, we don't have access to beauty as freely. It allows us to be curious about our sensations and emotions. If we're not judging them and criticizing our experiences and our emotions and our sensations, but we can be that curious observer, then we have space to look at them and to learn about them. That reduces that fight flight energy because again, we feel safe. It changes how we engage with hard things because we have space maybe to, to fail, to try, to make mistakes, to be human. It helps us regulate. It brings attune, attunement and validation. When we can be curious, that curiosity brings validation and attunement to what is going on, what is happening. When we can be that curious observer and it, that creates safety. And the next one, it, it is a cure of safety. And we've already talked about how those help our emotional health. And just as being a human, we just need self-compassion because life is hard, we make mistakes and we're human. And we need to have space to be human and make those mistakes and to take risks. So as you can see, as it, these are just a few, but it's very important, essential to our emotional health. So how does that help our physical health? What are the physical benefits of self-compassion? And believe it or not, this has been studied. There are dozens and dozens of research articles where they've studied people who implement self-compassion practices and the health benefits that follow, which is so cool that this is even measurable. Um, but Luke and I are all about physical emotional health and that's what we do at Flourish. Um, I support the physical health aspect. That's more of my experience and he supports the emotional health. And so these pillars all bring emotional and physical health benefits, which is so cool. So the physical benefits of self-compassion, some of them that we pulled from the research, lower cortisol, which is the primary stress hormone in the body. A lot of us, you don't want too low and you don't want too high. You want it right in the middle, like everything else in the body, you want balance. So lower cortisol, the levels are usually much higher um, in people who have chronic stress and uh, trauma. So having it be right in the middle helps improve health outcomes, improved immune function, better emotional regulation, that's physical and emotional, improved heart health, less anxiety and depression, less pain, more safety and relaxation in the body and more resiliency, physical resiliency as well. Uh, that's what we're referring to here. So compassion activates the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, parasympathetic and sympathetic, those are two modes of the nervous system that we use um, both and they're both essential. But again, uh, the modern human tends to have much more time in the sympathetic activation than parasympathetic. And so uh, what they think in the research, they think it's from that all these health outcomes come from compassion, self-compassion actually activating parasympathetic mode. And then from that place, when we're in parasympathetic mode, the body just thrives in that place and health improves dramatically when we have parasympathetic mode activation stimulation so this these are the benefits from from that and i just think it's really amazing there's a lot more but those are like some of the big ones and compassion produces resilience um so Ani kolber is one of our 
favorite authors. Uh, she's just got amazing content. So this is from her. How compassion produces resilience is it helps us keep our emotions regulated. We can tap into our mammalian caregiving system, which allows us to shift out of hypervigilance into that safe and social place. It increases our tolerance for difficult emotions, which improves our ability to process those and to actually experience healing. Helps us access our own inner parent, as well as other resources like spirituality that give meaning to our life. And it improves our ability to live out healthy choices since we're not stuck in shame. And as you can see, all those things kind of lead to that cyclical positive cycle of growth and healing instead of the cyclical negative cycles that the, the lack of compassion brings, that, that judgment and shame bring. These findings suggest that being kind to oneself switches off that threat response and puts the body in a state of safety and relaxation that is important for regeneration and healing. So this is just kind of speaks for itself. The more time we, we uh, spend in that parasympathetic state, the more we're gonna heal and regenerate and um, feel safe and social, connect and all those benefits that come from that. So how do we cultivate self-compassion? What are some things that we can, we can do? So being curious about what you are experiencing without judgment. It's so important to just be that benevolent witness. Like Lauren uh, shared in the practice, like somebody just listening and observing, attuning. It feels so good when other people can do that to us. And it feels so good when we are able to do that to other people. And when we can do it to ourselves, it feels just as good. I mean, it's a practice. It's something we can learn. Yeah. Just because you're not good at it, don't know how to do it, doesn't mean you can't be good at it. Accepting what you are feeling as real and valid. Um, so many times when we've had trauma, we haven't had compassion shown to us, been cared well or tuned well, which is so quick to just stuff what we're feeling, to deny what we're feeling, but to just accept it. It's the first pillar, just accept this reality as valid, this emotion, this sensation that helps cultivate self-compassion. Making space for when you are not feeling okay. Again, just being there. Listen to the messages your body is sharing. The state, the shift states, the state shifts when you're shifting states, the sensations, the emotions. Um, so often we feel like we have to be stronger, we have to we lose our voice, we get disembodied. And we don't listen to those messages. And I like to use the example of like a, a fire alarm and a fire. When a fire happens, a fire alarm goes off. We don't hear that annoying fire alarm and say, oh, that's so annoying. I wish it didn't do that and just turn it off or take it off the wall and just let the fire go. We hear that annoying sound and say, oh my goodness, something's wrong. Let's go find out what the source is and, and either find safety or help heal the problem. But when we have anxiety or depression or, or body aches or uh, can't sleep, feel stress, that's like that fire alarm. And we're just like, oh, it's so annoying. I can't believe this is happening. The body is so, so broken, so stupid. So fill in the blank. And we ignore that alarm and let the fire go. If we could just listen to those messages and say, oh, okay, body, what are you trying to show me? What, what, what is being triggered? What is being activated? Why do I feel this? And your body can help lead you to show you what, where the fire's at. And it's hard. We haven't been taught how to do that or that, that, that it's beneficial. But I just encourage you to have 
to listen to those messages and see those messages as uh, they're not bad. They are actually trying to bring healing and awareness to what is being, what has hurt you. So seeking out fun, beauty, because you're worth it. Again, if we've, if we've been at, spent most of our time in sympathetic activation or shutdown, we don't have a whole lot of access or permission for fun and beauty. But, but as we enter into fun and beauty, we can open ourselves up to self-compassion. As we open ourselves up to self-compassion, we can open ourselves up to fun and beauty. Um, and just understand that we're worth it. We're, we're worth just being us. Just who we are today in this moment deserves being cared for, having fun, having beauty, relaxing. Um, just let that wash over you. Receive that. Going at your pace, extending grace. You know when we can do that? We can have fun. We can engage in beauty. Some days we just need to take a break. Some days we just need to slow down, calm down. Uh, that's one of um, Andy Kolber's, one of my favorite books of hers is, is Try Softer. It's a great book about just rather than trying harder, white knuckling your way through it, pushing through it, it's actually just trying softer and listening to those messages your body is giving you and saying, I'm gonna slow down. And that's actually what next um, webinar's uh, topic is, is slowing down. So we'll talk more about that next time. To heal, you have to get to the root of the wound and kiss it all the way up. What a beautiful picture. And we can't get to the root of the wound without some self-compassion, without listening to those messages that body's giving you. And when we get there and see it, don't judge it, don't shame it, don't critique it, kiss it all the way up to healing. So that is the, the pillar of compassion. Um, we have five pillars, A, B, C, D, E's of healing through flourish therapy, acceptance, beauty, compassion. D is for down, representing slowing down and embodiment. Those are the five pillars that uh, lead to more healing and nervous system regulation, all with the foundation of safety. So we hope that this little talk, a uh, little summary kind of primer on self-compassion has been meaningful for you and has maybe reminded you of what you know to be true about how humans receive love and kindness and how you need that as well. Or maybe it's shown you a different perspective that you've really never considered before, but we hope that this uh, invitation feels really accessible to you on your journey, wherever you're at, wherever you're at in your healing, um, to start to bring in that self-compassion and how life-changing it is how healing it truly is for your physical and your emotional health. So uh, about our practice, Flourish Therapy has three major offerings. We have a signature program. This is where Luke and I work together with people to do trauma healing and brain retraining. So if this is, if you're needing some help with your healing, these are the, the different ways that we would love to come alongside you. <clears throat> signature program or Luke offers individual and couples trauma healing and then intensives uh, virtual or in person in our office in Chiang Mai Thailand um, intensives two and a half days to work with Luke and really jump in and get at whatever is feeling um, really more more urgent you don't want to wait for your six months to work on it so those are the three ways that we can work with you um, we would love to if that's a need for you and you can check out our website to see um, details about those offerings. We also have two different discounts running right now. We have 30% off of our <clears throat> three month signature program. And the code is there, um, it's 30% off in caps. And we also have 30% off of the one-on-one -on -one or couple intensive. So that is also, um, the code is there, it's intensive 30. 
So both of those are running now as we've launched and will be running for the next couple of months until um, they're no longer available. So hopefully those make the practice that much more accessible for you if this is what you're needing in your life right now. I wanna thank you all who are here, who are listening, um, who are watching the recording. We so appreciate uh, you being here uh, and just so respect and want to validate and acknowledge the effort that you're putting in to caring for yourself and learning how to care for yourself and learning how to heal. Uh, you're doing a great job and you're worth it for good work. And now we'll transition into our question and answer time. 